Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, a very warm good evening to you. I'm Alexander Downer. I used to be the chairman of the Royal Overseas League. Now I'm the chairman of its foundation. Um, and if you make a donation to the foundation, that, that's tax advant advantageous. So don't um, hesitate. If you enjoy this evening to um, include uh, Rosal in your will, um, or, something, or something like that. Well, I'm not sure that the news is going to be that bad. In any case, um, this is the latest in our public affairs series of lectures. And as many of you will know, we've had some very distinguished lecturers here over the last couple of years. And tonight is no exception where we have John Soares, who is best known, I guess, to the public for having been the former head of what we call MI6, um, the Special Intelligence Service. And you'd all be familiar with that organization, even if you're not very familiar with the details, or not meant to be familiar with the details of what it does. Um, uh, but uh, I first came across John when he was the UK's ambassador or permanent representative, of, as they say, to the United Nations in New York. Um, and he was there during a, a fairly um, difficult time in the wake of the Iraq war. He wasn't actually the ambassador there at the time of the Iraq war when it first started, but during the, um, what you might call legacy period, um, uh, and I was the Australian foreign minister at the time, and so having been with the British and the Americans in Iraq, we um, then had to deal with the political fallout from all of that, which was um, was very interesting. Um, and, and we Australians uh, took very seriously what the British had to say and worked very closely with them. So John was always a great person to talk to, a great help to us, and I think he did a magnificent job as the ambassador for the UK there in uh, New York during that period. So I mean, he is the consummate uh, diplomat um, as I've just described, and he has one other um, uh, feather in his cap, and that is that he's actually a member of the Royal Overseas League and has been for the last couple of years, and he thinks it's just the greatest place. Um, so um, it's always good to see him around here from time to time. And so John um, is going to talk to us tonight. Um, we're, we've, we've very loosely termed the talk, um, you know, how to deal with the autocracies, but um, to talk about um, current international issues. And then after he's talked for a while, for as long as he wishes, within reason, um, then we are going to have a Q&A session, as is uh, customary with these talks, and then we'll throw it open to questions from the floor. So think up the hardest question you possibly can and see if you can stump him. Um, but it won't be one of those questions like, what is the capital of Ecuador? Because he'll know all that stuff. Um, so uh, with those few words, it's with great pleasure that I introduce John. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Royal Overseas League. Um, when I was asked to do this uh, talk, um, I was asked to submit a title. And this was several months ago. And uh, one thing my wife says to me when I uh, speak in public is that uh, uh, when I was a diplomat, everything was, everything was glass half full. There were always positives to talk about. When I was an intelligence chief, it was always glass half empty, always warning of the dark things that were going to happen next. Um, and Shelley always says to me, for heaven's sake, don't leave them feeling so gloomy at the end of your, your, your talks. So I thought I'd talk positively about autocracy on the back foot, uh, with a special reference, uh, uh, reference to uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, and uh, Iran. And I, I, I made a few notes, so forgive me if I talk from, from the notes. Um, and this is partly, uh, I wanted to, to address this, because I think we've uh, been very focused in recent years on the on the vulnerability of our liberal democracies. We've seen uh, 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 the rise of populism, identity politics. We've seen some uh, uh, individuals who, frankly, had no right to uh, occupy leadership roles uh, uh, taking such positions in, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and we've had, uh, 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 in, in, in the Labour Party, Conservative Party, Democratic Party, and, and Republican Party, uh, in the sort of first-past-the-post systems, 
you've seen this, uh, uh, this populism entering into the political system through the mainstream parties, because we are condemned by our uh, electoral system to have, uh, have just two major parties competing for power. Uh, very difficult for new parties to emerge. And when uh, a major party is, is taken over by, by, by populist forces, you do get challenges to the checks and balances of a democratic system. Uh, the, you, the, these leaders want to impose their power, impose their will, uh, with, uh, with as few restraints as possible. Um, institutions get undermined, election results get challenged, and uh, uh, some of us fear for the future of liberal democracy. I think we may be passing through that phase. I sincerely hope so. Uh, certainly, uh, in this country, we now have a stable and sensible leader uh, who is going to carry some respect, and I think that's a huge advantage on, frankly, where we were before. Uh, I think the results of this week's uh, midterm elections in America, uh, there are two winners of that, uh, Ron DeSantis and, and Joe Biden, and one big loser who's Donald Trump. And if that uh, uh, enables us to move on from the Trump era, that would be uh, a great bonus. And at the same time as worrying about the state of our own democracies, we've been rather fixed on the concerns about these big autocratic powers becoming more powerful, looking like as they're going to uh, be entrenched in office. Uh, in China, uh, you have Xi Jinping with a third term in, in power uh, uh, and quite possibly setting himself up for fourth and, and fifth terms beyond that. In Russia, you have Putin invading Ukraine uh, and uh, keeping very tight control uh, at home through his uh, security services. In Iran, we see challenges to the regime on the streets, extraordinary bravery by the protesters there. But perhaps we have a sense of resignation and sadness that uh, uh, in the end, the security services there will probably prevail. We hope not, but uh, uh, it looks uh, usually when you pit peaceful demonstrators against, uh, against security forces, uh, the former come off second best. So um, autocracy, of course, is a different system of government. It's all centralized control limited or zero political freedoms, uh, and it's a very different form of, of government. Uh, and its practitioners believe it's actually more effective uh, than uh, the democratic systems at exerting power and at building uh, a nation. And this evening I want to look more closely at these autocracies. They're challenging our views in the world, our, our values in the world. Uh, they have formidable data-driven surveillance systems and ruthless security services. Uh, but I think each in their own way, China, Russia, Iran, they are under pressure. They uh, are having to take some more extreme actions to remain in power, and they're facing increasing obstacles, economic stagnation, and loss of political legitimacy. Of course, these three countries aren't the only ones under autocratic rule, but they are the ones that seek to challenge the concept of liberal democracy. And in a nice little uh, balance, they're at slightly different stages. Uh, Xi Jinping is uh, now in his 11th year in power. Vladimir Putin has been uh, dominated Russia for 22 years. And Ali Khamenei has been the supreme leader in Iran for 33 years. So we can see these autocrats at different stages of their uh, rule. And what marks out these three regimes? Well, first of all, the highest priority for each of them is regime survival and regime security. They see the regime's survival as identical with the interests of the nation. And the growth of the economy, the development of the people, the nation's defense, all these are geared primarily to, make, to ensuring that the regime uh, survives and keeps, stays in place. And the biggest threat to these regimes, whatever they may point to outside about the, uh, the evils of Western intelligence and, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, hostility of Western powers, Actually, the biggest threat comes from their own population. Uh, the regimes operate in fear of their own people. And maybe they're right to do so. And in Russia, uh, twice in the last 100 years or so, the Russian system has collapsed in the face of popular protest. In 1917, it actually collapsed twice in 1917, and again in 1991. And Putin does not want to be in a position uh, where that happens again in Russia. <clears throat> it's interesting, these leaders quite often start off with aims of economic reform. I remember when I was working for Tony Blair in number 10, uh, it coincided with Putin coming into, uh, into uh, uh, power in, in Russia. 
And Putin had several meetings that I was uh, uh, taking part in. These meetings quite often are, uh, uh, are what we call one plus one. You have the leader plus a note taker, and uh, Putin had the same on his side and an interpreter. Uh, and uh, I was the sort of plus one on our side. And I was very struck by how those early meetings between Putin and Blair were focused on, um, uh, 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 on economic reform, on stabilizing Russia, on commercial reform, land reform, banking reform, the issues that Putin thought were most important for him to get a grip after the chaos of the, of the uh, 1990s uh, uh, free for all in Russia. Um, but of course, what happened then was that there were challenges in neighboring countries in Ukraine and Jordan, uh, Ukraine and Georgia, sorry, uh, and uh, the so-called colored revolutions. Uh, and Putin concluded that actually economic reform creates alternative sources of power, either the street or, or oligarchs. And he moved ruthlessly against Mikhail Khodorkovsky and dismantled his, em his uh, commercial empire of Yukos because Khodorkovsky was posing a threat to his uh, to the centralized uh, political power uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Moscow and in Putin's hands. And uh, uh, economic reform in Russia basically came to an end in 2003. We only saw about two years of it. Um, and that's one reason why Russia remains heavily dependent on just a few industries, oil and gas, agriculture, uh, defense equipment, and nuclear. And Xi Jinping also started with promises of economic reform. The third plenum of the 18th Party Congress uh, back in 2013 made a whole series of com commitments to uh, increase the role of the market in resource allocation uh, and to attract more foreign investment. Uh, but very few of those steps have been implemented. Now, China is vastly more integrated with the global economy than Russia or the Soviet Union ever were. But that's because of the strategy laid down by Deng Xiaoping and carried on with his successors, uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, uh, 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 through the uh, 1990s and the 2000s. Um, but President Xi has not only centralized control of, uh, of, of politics and closed down what, whatever space there may have been opening up uh, for debate on policy within China. He's also uh, intimidating the oligarchs in the same way that Putin took on Khodorkovsky, uh, uh, Xi Jinping took on Jack Ma, the founder and executive chairman of, uh, of, of Alibaba, and one of the most um, influential and thoughtful uh, business leaders in China, because uh, Jack Ma had made a speech criticizing um, the, uh, uh, the, the regime's economic policy. Um, uh, so uh, whereas uh, the idea was with, of, um, uh, of Deng Xiaoping and his successors was to have a system of a market economy with sort of Chinese characteristics. Uh, what Xi Jinping uh, believes in is state capitalism and not in uh, the role uh, of the market. Now, Iran is a little different. They've had a very long tradition of trade and enterprise in Iran, but economic power over the last 20 years or so has been progressively centralized uh, in uh, the so-called bonyads, uh, charitable trusts, which now own over 20% of the um, uh, of the uh, 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 Iranian economy, and another 20% is occupied by the oil and gas industry. Uh, and most of these, uh, these bonyads and the oil and gas industry is dominated by the Revolutionary Guards, the IRGC. Uh, so again, in Iran, you've got <clears throat> a system of state-run capitalism. You don't really have a market operating, except in the, in the, in the bazaars and the, at, at a low level of, of, of trade and, and, and enterprise. Of course, <clears throat> In liberal democracy, that goes hand in hand with the market economy. But modern day autocrats are simply not prepared to risk economic reform that provide for freedom of choice. Now, Western sanctions have played a role in each of these countries. And it's quite understandable that uh, if you're a leader in uh, uh, Moscow, Beijing, or Tehran, you might want to try and limit your exposure to uh, these sanctions. The most powerful sanctions that have been developed recently have been uh, financial sanctions, uh, exploiting the role of the dollar. Now, of course, there's a way out for these countries. Uh, they could uh, have a currency which is, uh, which is convertible uh, and which uh, is a basis for, for, for trading between nations and uh, which others can use as a store of reserves. But of course, if your uh, currency is convertible, then you're subject to the uh, forces of, uh, of international capital markets. 
and that, again, is simply not something that these autocrats are prepared uh, to risk. And so you then end up with the consequence of central control. And this is one of the lessons we learned from the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, enterprise uh, declines, private investment falls, capital allocation by the state is inefficient, and economic growth stalls. And we're seeing this in each of these three countries. Uh, and the essential deal between an autocratic regime and its people is we will deliver increasing standards of living in return for you leaving us in power. But if your economy is flatlining or declining, that's much harder to sustain. Now, on top of this economic weaknesses, all these three countries also have demographic problems. They all have uh, an aging population, uh, declining fertility rates, <clears throat> uh, and a workforce which uh, is, is beginning to shrink, and in, in Russia's uh, case has shrunk quite markedly. And Russia's population has been largely static since the breakup of the Soviet Union, but the average age is increasing. The proportion of over 65-year-olds simply in the last decade has gone from 13% to 16% of the population. And in the last year, we've seen literally hundreds of thousands of young Russians uh, fleeing the country. They may have lost their jobs, they may be in fear of conscription, but most likely they just lost confidence in their country uh, after the uh, invasion of Ukraine. I'll say more about that later. And the only areas of Russia that have a growing population are those with a non-Russian, non-ethnic Russian population. And that's hardly uh, comfort to those in the capital, in the Kremlin. China famously had an exploding population uh, until the uh, end of the 70s, early 80s, um, uh, when uh, Deng Xiaoping introduced the famous or infamous one-child policy. But China's population has now reached its peak. Uh, its uh, workforce has also uh, probably reached its peak, may well be past its peak. Uh, and uh, uh, that creates uh, uh, increasing problems uh, as they want to um, uh, go up the value chain, but they don't have the necessarily the skills or the population to underpin that uh, in the economy. Iran has a similar problem, slightly less acute, but still has this issue of declining fertility rates uh, and an aging population. And Iran has the added problem of a very mixed population. Less than half of Iranians are Persian, and the other half are a mix of uh, different uh, minorities, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Azeri, uh, Baluchi, Arab, uh, Uzbek and others. Uh, and um, that creates new fault lines in the country if you can only feel you can only really rely on less than half the population if it boils down to uh, 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 real divisions within the country. So that's the second problem is their demographics. Now, of course, we in the West have demographic problems as well, uh, but we can quite often meet that through immigration. Now, it's a contested issue in America, in Britain, in the European Union. Uh, uh, but we, uh, there are at least people queuing up to come to our countries, too many of them in many respects, um, uh, uh, to where we can uh, bolster our workforce. There aren't many people queuing up to enter Russia, China, and uh, Iran. And the third big problem these countries have, these autocrats have, is the problem of succession. Now, China had actually solved this. Uh, creating succession in an autocratic system is notoriously hard. Uh, uh, monarchies manage it, and they have a, a, a high degree of legitimacy in the way they do that. Uh, but Deng designed a process where Chinese leaders rotated out of power, uh, that after 10 years, new leaders would come forward, they'd be able to assess the situation, make a course correction, they weren't wedded to a single set of, uh, uh, of policies, they could adapt, um, uh, learning the lessons from their predecessors. Uh, because you had rotating leaders coming in and out every 10 years, it meant there was more of a collective sense of leadership uh, in China and a, and a pretty well formalized uh, distinction between the role of the president and of the prime minister. Well, we all know what's happened to that. Uh, it basically, Deng Xiaoping, uh, uh, basically Xi Jinping has uh, thrown out that system of checks and balances that Deng Xiaoping introduced. And uh, with no rising star on the new standing committee, there's no obstacle to Xi Jinping uh, having not just a, a third term, but a fourth uh, or fifth term uh, uh, beyond. Um, and of course the Standing Committee, which is supposed to be the, the place that debates and decides uh, on the future direction of the country, is little more than a fan club of Xi Jinping's former chiefs of staff and private secretaries. It's hardly a basis for collective leadership. 
And in Russia, of course, there's not even the pretense of a collective leadership. We all watched with amazement that televised meeting of the National Security Council, and we saw the reality of how Putin actually runs his country. Uh, there was, uh, uh, Putin himself was utterly dominant, and his lieutenants were, were almost groveling before him, trying desperately to say the right thing. Now, if Putin were to die, there is no process uh, in Russia to select a successor. Yes, there's a process to ratify a successor once one's emerged in the Duma and so on, um, but there's no process for actually, no collective leadership, there's no body that comes together and says, we've got a problem, we need to find a solution. Uh, and that means that if um, uh, Putin were suddenly to die uh, or he was uh, overthrown, uh, which is not impossible, um, uh, then we, don't, we simply don't know what would happen in, in Russia uh, uh, thereafter. Uh, and I think this is quite relevant because although there's no sign of Putin um, uh, being challenged internally, we know what would happen to any challenger who emerged. Uh, there's no doubt that the Russian regime is weaker than it was uh, nine months ago. Uh, many people in Russia have lost their livelihoods, lost their assets, uh, lost their freedom to travel, um, uh, and many have uh, uh, had raised serious doubts about Putin's judgment. Um, uh, of course, we won't know uh, if there's any challenge to Putin until it's actually underway, and it would require some elements of the security establishment to move against Putin, because there's not going to be a move from the street uh, itself. I Iran is slightly different. Iran perhaps has the most sophisticated system. There's a, uh, uh, there's a body, the Assembly of Experts, that's created in the Constitution precisely to deal with the succession issue. Uh, so uh, here there is a difference between the Iranian system and the, uh, on the one hand and the Russians and Chinese uh, on the other. The, um, uh, of course, the Assembly of Experts has only had to meet once in serious, serious business in the last 43 years, uh, and that was when uh, Khomeini died and they chose Ali Khamenei as, uh, as the new supreme leader. Um, but even then, once you've established that you've, you've come through with uh, some process which has chosen you, you still have to establish your personal authority and carry the system with you. And that brings us to the fourth challenge that all these autocrats face, which is one of legitimacy. Now, to stay in power, an autocrat needs a degree of popular consent. You need powerful security forces to deal with protests, uh, keep an eye on malcontents. And, uh, but as we saw in Iran in 1979, as we saw in Egypt in 2011, there's a limit to the extent that you can rely upon your armed forces to fire on your own people. And that is the crucial point that no autocrat wants to get to, where you have to use extreme force in order to put down uh, 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 protests. Sometimes it worked. It worked in Tiananmen Square in 1989. We sometimes look back um, uh, on the Deng Xiaoping era and think uh, here is uh, someone who, who understood the world and uh, was someone we wish we had back in power now. But we should never forget that he was the architect of the crushing of the Tiananmen Square uh, uh, demonstrations uh, as well. Um, <coughs> The, uh, so, so if you're an autocrat, how do you secure consent? Well, as I say, the first way is to um, uh, deliver services to your people. Uh, food, uh, shelter, uh, physical security, and then more developed services like healthcare and education. And as long as these things are on a rising trend, uh, that your lifestyle is getting better, then quite often the, the mass of the population will swallow that and accept that even if there are severe constraints on their travel, on their movement, on their uh, opportunities, uh, and so on. Uh, but as I say, it's more difficult to do that when, when the economy is flatlining. And Putin, I think, was an excellent example of an autocrat who pivoted from the initial deal of, you leave us in power and we will improve your standards of living, to a new deal whereby, you leave us in power and I will make Russia a great power in the world. Uh, Appeal to the the national, uh, the, 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 the national case uh, that, uh, 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 that uh, was lost at the end of the Cold War in many Russian eyes and that Putin could restore and which has <coughs> a lot of support um, uh, at, at home. Uh, and Iran has a revolution which is now 43 years old, very middle-aged, um, and uh, it justifies it to some extent by provoking difficulties with its neighbors, interfering 
successfully in some ways in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in, in Yemen, um, and uh, creating uh, the sense that there is an external threat against the regime in order to create a sense of national, uh, 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 of uh, a threat to the nation uh, and a national purpose uh, behind the, uh, the extreme measures that they have uh, at home to keep in power. Uh, of course, over four decades, China succeeded spectacularly uh, in improving the standards of living of the Chinese people. Um, but it kept alive the national project as well, keeping control of Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, reabsorbing uh, Hong Kong and, uh, in due course, Taiwan as they would see it. Uh, the, uh, and I think we'll see uh, Deng Xiaoping, sorry, I think we'll see Xi Jinping uh, placing more and more emphasis on this because the outlook for the Chinese economy we were expecting it, we got used to it, growing at 6 to 8% a year for most of the last uh, 20 years. But it now looks as though it may not grow much more than 2 or 3% a year. Uh, and if it grows at only 2 or 3% a year, that much vaunted moment when the Chinese economy becomes larger than the United States economy may frankly never arrive. We may never uh, get there. Um, uh, now, the... Uh, I think the Chinese efforts to control COVID are an interesting case study uh, in all this. Um, the, uh, we've seen draconian measures inside China, uh, and it's become a sort of article of, of faith for the regime that their system has been better than the Western system at coping with COVID, at uh, minimizing the number of deaths, uh, and in protecting the health uh, of the nation. Of course, they were uh, encouraged down this path because of the poor efficacy of Chinese vaccines and the fact that their healthcare system could well be overwhelmed if, uh, if uh, COVID does become uh, viral there. Uh, sorry, forgive the pun. Uh, does, uh, does get out of control. <coughs> but of course, the price of these draconian measures increases the longer uh, they remain in place. And I think that uh, uh, the Xi's regime is going to have to find a way out of the COVID cul-de-sac that they're in. Um, in part because they really can't afford uh, uh, economy to be flat over a, a good number of years. They've got to find a way of growth. Um, but they will ha they will, uh, they're experimenting with this in Hong Kong at the moment. Um, but we'll see how quickly they, are, they do manage to, uh, to get out of the cul-de-sac that they're in. Now, the ultimate expression of great power status is to wage a war and to win it. And Putin's motives for launching his invasion of Ukraine may never be fully clear. He was convinced that Ukraine was really part of Mother Russia. He wanted to restore um, his, uh, uh, Russia's undisputed position as a great power, his contest with the West over uh, hegemony in Central Europe. All these uh, played a part. But I think the most central one is that he thought that he was creating um, a, a position for Russia of greater strength for which he, Vladimir Putin, would be remembered in the history books and which would leave Russia uh, in as a powerful position in the 21st century as it was under the Soviet era in, uh, uh, for decades in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, I think the scale of his miscalculation is coming clear, um, but the long-term implications for Russia are only going to unfold over a good many years. Um, the decision, of course, was his alone. There was no debate within the Russian regime. Many senior members of it were clearly taken by surprise. It's not only autocrats that launch wars. Alexander, you mentioned the Iraq war. Um, and in 2003, President Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair and other uh, Western leaders uh, uh, also on a false prospectus and with pretty uh, uh, disastrous consequences, not least the rise of Iranian power uh, in the Persian, in, in the uh, in the region, in the Middle East region, as a result of it, but it was uh, uh, it was against the backdrop of 9/11, and in the face of a, a genuine tyrant in Saddam Hussein, and democratic decisions were taken in the U.S. Congress, in the House of Commons, and in other legislatures that took part in the conflict. It was a collective mistake, I think we could say with hindsight, to have gone into uh, Iraq. It, it wasn't the result of one man's uh, conviction. And of course, in Iraq, the war was won quickly. Uh, we then struggled with the, uh, what the French call the après guerre, uh, the period after the war as we tried to uh, reestablish uh, order. But Russia in Ukraine can't even win its war, uh, let alone um, 
impose some order in the areas that it has occupied. Now, the issue which has uh, occupied a lot of um, uh, international attention, of course, is China and its proclivity to go to war, in particular over Taiwan as the most likely trigger. We've seen debates about uh, the Thucydides trap. Uh, we've seen one of your successors, Alexander, as Foreign Minister and later Prime Minister Kevin Rudd write a rather good book called um, uh, uh, The Avoidable War, um, uh, where he sets out an alternative thesis to the, Thuc to the uh, Thucydides trap. Um, uh, and I have to say, this is something which obviously has to uh, 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 command all of our attentions. I had, for the last few years, I've interpreted the Chinese approach to Taiwan has been to hold their position, gradually increase the pressure on Taiwan, but to leave until future years uh, uh, any sort of confrontation, especially a confrontation with the United States, until China's relative strength in economic and military terms has grown, uh, and uh, it's sufficient to make a US intervention in Taiwan's defense uh, uh, unrealistic. But the facts have changed, and as the facts change, uh, we have to rethink. China's growth may never overtake, uh, China's economy may never overtake that uh, of the United States. Uh, the top leadership in Beijing is now devoid of any uh, economic expertise and designed to provide unquestioning support for Xi Jinping. The stage is set for Xi to make a similar mistake to the one that Putin has made. And rather than watching the Ukraine war unfold and concluding that China should never make a similar mistake, it's possible that Xi might be making the opposite calculation. That the time to achieve his goal of bringing, back to, uh, bringing Taiwan back under Beijing's uh, control might be sooner rather than later. And I was struck by uh, Tony Blinken, the US Secretary of State's recent comments that the US assess that Xi Jinping's timeline for absorbing Taiwan into China was shorter than the Americans had previously thought. Now, I'm not predicting imminent war in the Pacific. I'm just less confident in my mind as to how US-China relations are going to unfold and how the Chinese will approach the issue of Taiwan over the next five to 10 years. In some ways, Washington and Beijing have tried to manage the uh, relationship. I was quite struck when Nancy Pelosi, the US Speaker uh, of the House of Representatives, visited uh, uh, Taiwan. The, both Washington and Beijing had to do certain things. They were compelled by their positions to uh, take certain actions. But they both managed it actually reasonably well, so it didn't get out of control. There seemed to be a flaw under the relationship, such so neither side wanted to uh, go uh, below, which hadn't been there uh, in the, uh, under the previous administration. But we have to prepare for all possibilities. The Chinese know as little as we do about the future course of US politics. Uh, and the opportunities that some politicians may take to profile themselves on the China issue and on uh, Taiwan. And uh, there's increasing attention being focused to the period 2026, 20, 2027, uh, towards the end of Xi Jinping's third term, when he might need to have uh, some success. If he can't show any successes with the Chinese economy, he may need to have some successes to show uh, elsewhere. Now, I don't think that Xi Jinping is at serious risk of uh, the Communist Party system in China collapsing. Russia, as I've explained, is I think is slightly more vulnerable than China on this front. The Russian army is being put in an impossible position uh, in Ukraine, and there could well be a response against that. But Putin's control seems uh, to be pretty tight uh, for now. We can't say the same about the Islamic Republic uh, in Iran. The regime is facing the biggest threat in its 43-year history. And you can never predict that an autocratic regime is going to topple. We've all been reading, uh, many, many people have been quoting Ernest Hemingway and his uh, character who went bankrupt, asked how it happened. He said, first gradually and then suddenly. And the same happens with autocratic regimes. You never quite predict when it's going to go from the gradual decline into the sudden uh, collapse. We'd have to be a little bit careful what we wish for. When autocracies collapse, they aren't magically replaced by liberal democracy. In fact, the only example I can think of that happening was in Poland after 1989, where amazingly, the Poles 
appointed, selected a group of intellectuals who sat around the table and drafted and thrashed out a new constitution. And lo and behold, communism collapsed and is replaced by a system of multi-party democracy. But in most other cases, Russia in the 1990s, uh, go back to the, the, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, the, uh, uh, what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, you, you move uh, an autocratic figure, they aren't replaced by liberal democracies. And actually the better way out of an autocracy is for a change of leadership to herald a new approach. Xi Jinping has done this in reverse. In many ways, Deng did this in the, in, to move China out of the Maoist uh, era of, 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 of ghastly repression and, uh, and, and uh, centralized mistakes. But Xi Jinping has taken China back down that path towards a more Maoist system and a more of a system of, of confrontation. Mikhail Gorbachev is a rather uncelebrated leader of the Soviet Union. In fact, he's rather reviled in, in Moscow, in Beijing, uh, these days. But I think, in my assessment, he did more than any other individual to bring an end to the Cold War and bring it to a peaceful close. And likewise, in Iran, you had President Khatami, who was never supreme leader. Uh, he was elected president, spent eight years as president. If Khatami had become the supreme leader at any stage, uh, our, uh, the, the Islamic Revolution would have remained in place in name but its nature and our relationship with it would be totally different from how it is today uh, after another 20 years of, uh, of Khamenei as supreme leader. So we need to be a little bit careful what we wish for uh, when we think that autocrats are so ghastly that they, they must be perfect if they, if they just collapse and something else will better will replace them. That's not always uh, the case. So what's my conclusions on all this? Well, first of all, however shaky our liberal democracies might seem, we shouldn't think that the autocracies who confront us are somehow impregnable or in a stronger position. They're not. They have fundamental challenges they're facing, uh, economic, demographic, uh, succession ones, and legitimacy. Uh, and uh, they, uh, this is something that, um, in different ways, puts all three countries, China, Russia, and Iran, on the back foot. And their ruling regimes have to retain power while denying their people the basic freedoms of speech and identity. Uh, ideology tries to impose a degree of uniformity in China uh, and Iran. There's no real ideology in Russia these days. But ideology doesn't carry much traction for ordinary members of the population struggling to feed their families and to uh, find a, a better future. And in all these countries, whatever controls they have over the technology and the internet, these people can see how the rest of the world live. And they want a bit of it uh, too. <coughs> As I said earlier, the biggest conclusion, uh, the biggest lesson that we learned from the, so from the Cold War was that the Soviet system was rotten at its core, and in particular because its economic performance was so bad. And we mustn't forget that auto autocracies cannot run a thriving, successful uh, economy. And the policy conclusion now is to address our own weaknesses. We've done a fair amount of damage to ourselves. I would include Brexit. Uh, in that self-damage uh, that we've done. Trump was a, uh, 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 although he, 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 not everything Trump did was necessarily bad. I think he invented a new, developed a new China policy that we've all basically uh, been following. Uh, but the damage he's done to American politics is, 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 is very far reaching. Um, and I think uh, here in the UK, uh, Rishi Sunak has a chance to rebuild uh, Britain's position uh, after six years of rather wayward leadership and, and, uh, 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 and poor economic performance here in the UK. And certainly the Ukraine war has made us all realize that we can't take any of this for granted, that the threats are there, the threats to our values, the threats to our way of life, the need to defend ourselves with a reinvigorated uh, NATO and a, re and a real determination to face up to the threats that we are facing in the world. So I hope my wife, if she was here, she would feel that um, I've uh, not sunk you in doom and gloom, uh, that there are some reasons to be cheerful uh, in the, uh, as we look out in the world. They're not always apparent, but we shouldn't think that our opponents are 10 feet tall and impregnable and undefeatable. Uh, the fact is they all face very serious problems greater than we in the West face. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, thanks very much, uh, John. I thought that was, uh, that was a masterclass. I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, you expressed your views about those three autocracies with remarkable clarity, and I think with great depth and wisdom as well, if you don't mind me saying so. However, I can offer you one piece of information, an autocracy that has collapsed and been replaced by a liberal democracy. It just shows here in the UK, you don't think enough about Asia, yeah. Indonesia, yeah. the fourth most populous country in the world, collapsed, the authoritarian regime collapsed in 1998 in the midst of the Asian economic crisis. And it's remarkable. The transition to democracy in Indonesia is one of the great stories of the evolution of liberal democracy in this world. It's also a Muslim country. You're exactly right. I stand corrected. Thank you. <laughs> so make sure you include that one I will. in your speech. But I thought it was fantastic. Um, I, I suppose where I would go listening to you and not wishing to go back over the ground that you've so brilliantly covered, um, what I would um, ask you is, how do you feel the West, the liberal democracies really, because the West does include countries like Japan and the Republic of Korea and so on, how do you think in broad strategic terms they should approach these countries? Um, uh, after all, these countries say they want, they, they agree with each other, although they're very different, they agree with each other that they want to reduce the power of America in particular and the West in general, the liberal democracies. Um, so how do we, how do we deal with them? Um, do we pursue a policy of containment? Mm. Do we pursue, uh, do we try to develop a strategic relationship with them? Um, what is the best approach? Well, I, I think one thing that we've learnt to our cost uh, through the last uh, few years, through COVID, through Ukraine, through uh, um, the changing nature of China, um, <clears throat> is that you have to be mindful of your strategic dependencies. Uh, Germany is the extreme case in this, uh, which was uh, totally dependent on the United States for its security, totally dependent upon Russia for its energy, and totally dependent upon China for its export markets. And all three, <laughs> three, well put. Uh, all three have been, uh, have been uh, brought into question uh, in, in recent years in, in different ways, and it's, it's creating a, 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 a massive upheaval uh, inside Germany. I think we, um, the first thing that the West needs to do is rebuild its unity, um, uh, and that was put under a lot of strain, clearly, during the, uh, uh, during the, um, uh, uh, the Trump period. Um, uh, I, I think, as I was saying, uh, uh, there's reasons to be a bit more optimistic that we are past <coughs> the worst period of this, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, every, every country's politics is, uh, is difficult to, to, to manage. But what that, uh, difficult to predict, but what that Trump era did was it made America's natural allies question whether it could actually rely upon America. Um, and uh, you've seen that, and the main driver, I think, for um, uh, increased defense spending in Europe isn't because the Americans have been telling them to increase defense spending, it's because they're suddenly realizing that they may not be able to depend upon America uh, in years to come uh, uh, in the same way that they have uh, in the past. Um, and I was very struck that in uh, South Korea, there is now a majority of the South Korean population uh, that uh, supports South Korea acquiring nuclear weapons because they do not, not any longer have faith that the American nuclear umbrella over South Korea in the face of North Korea's threats uh, will actually hold good. Um, and this questioning of America's leadership, um, uh, I think, is something which we, we need to address. Um, uh, now, in some ways, it's, uh, America has been, in a sense, acting out of character for the last 75 years. The tradition of America was being rather inward looking. Uh, 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 focused on its own growth and development. And it was, it was the uh, period after the Second World War when America agreed to take and adopted a position of leadership in the world. There was a, uh, we can't take that for granted. 
So we need to be engaged with the United States uh, uh, very closely. We need to make sure that the NATO alliance is working, that the Asian Quad is working with uh, uh, your country and India and Japan and, and, and interestingly, Canada and South Korea want to become part of that, that process uh, as well. So preserving and nurturing our alliances is the core strength of the West, uh, which we need to work much harder at than I think we have before. Uh, the second dimension of it is we need to make sure we, uh, uh, we realize we're in a strategic competition, uh, and that means we need to develop our um, <clears throat> own technology, our own self-sufficiency in crucial minerals, for example, uh, and not be overly dependent. I think COVID showed that you know, we were ridiculously dependent even for things like plastic gloves and face masks on, on China. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, they're never going to become strategically important uh, 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 goods, but uh, for each industry, for each company, uh, for each country, we need to realize and work out where our dependencies are and make sure we've got much greater resilience uh, than we've had in the past. So those would be my two uh, key uh, messages. Now, obviously, we need to have a common analysis of China, a common analysis of Russia, um, uh, and that can be done by uh, diplomats and uh, defense people working behind the scenes. Uh, but I think we, where, we've, uh, where we've fallen short in the last 30 years in particular is just taking for granted that the process of globalization and lower costs uh, leads inevitably to a better outcome. Uh, and there's no perfect example of how it doesn't always be the case than Germany. I've just been um, reading Henry Kissinger's latest book. Isn't that amazing? At 99, producing a book. Of, I don't know if you've read it. On, um, on, this is on artificial intelligence. On, the, on, on leadership. 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 No. The art, not artificial intelligence was the one before. Last year. I've not read that one. <laughs> um, my intelligence isn't enough to absorb artificial intelligence. Um, but um, Henry Kissinger, remind, reading his book, reminds me of, uh, of course, the great initiatives that he took and Richard Nixon took in separating Russia from, from China and mm. all that flowed from that. And the, the Kissinger-Nixon initiative on China happened during the Vietnam War when the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese, were being heavily supported by China and Russia. Mm. So it was, it was quite, when you read back over that period, it's extraordinary. And it makes me wonder how much effort we should be putting in, albeit not necessarily publicly, to trying to separate Russia from, uh, China, the other way around, China from Russia. Yeah. Um, and do you think there might be some opening there as a result of the catastrophic performance of the Russians in Ukraine? Uh, possibly. Uh, when China looks out at the world, its strategic challenge is the United States. <clears throat> and Russia is a useful junior partner in that strategic challenge. But what the Russians have done in Ukraine um, has been really quite embarrassing to the Chinese, driven a coach and horses through principles like uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity and non-interference. Non-interference in internal affairs. Which, yeah. which underpin China's position on all its key issues uh, about its own country. Um, and you know, the Russians have asked for Chinese weapons. The Chinese have given none. The Russians have asked the Chinese to provide support for getting around Western sanctions. The Chinese have given none. Uh, the only thing the Chinese have given is a degree of diplomatic support and not all of that has been, uh, has been uh, wholehearted. So I think the Chinese are embarrassed by what the uh, Russians have done. But still, their strategic challenge, they're very clear-headed about this. Uh, Russia is, a, is a, you know, it can be useful, it can be harmful. But the strategic challenge for, the United, for China is the United States. And I think what's going to be required is, is it a new Nixon to China? I don't know, but it needs to be a much more thorough, grounded, detailed, granular, frequent engagement at senior level between Washington and Beijing than we've had for the last 10 years. Um, uh, and that requires, uh, uh, it, there's been a strategic engagement like on the commercial side. You've had in New Hurt, uh, the, uh, 
a senior figure and consigliere to, uh, to, on economic matters to Xi Jinping, someone who had the authority to negotiate with the West, with Europe, with the uh, United States, and make concessions and come back with a deal. Uh, uh, there is no one in the Russian system who has that authority on, on political and security matters. <clears throat> and uh, if there's any silver cloud, silver lining to the uh, 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 to Xi Jinping staying in power for a third term, is that is he going to allow someone to have a serious conversation to build some form of strategic understanding uh, as we develop between the United States and Russia, the United States and the Soviet Union during the uh, during the Cold War? I think it's that lack of of a strategic understanding uh, as to uh, what each side is prepared to do, what each side's red lines are, what happens if a red line is crossed, uh, that is lacking in the US-China relationship. Um, and it requires, you know, there are intelligent people on the US side, and Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, will be perfectly capable of having that negotiation yeah. from a China, from an American perspective. He doesn't have uh, the right interlocutor or anyone authorized to speak in these terms on the Chinese side. On the other hand, um, through a meet the, the meeting is about to happen at the G20, mm. uh, G20, which is in Indonesia, mm -hmm. actually, exactly. um, between Xi Jinping and President Biden. Mm. I just read today, I hadn't quite realized this, this is the first time they will have met face to face. Since they were both vice presidents ago. Uh, yeah, no, uh, since, um, since, 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 since sorry, been, since President Biden has yeah, been yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, And it seems to me, I mean, there are, there are explanations for that which we don't know, uh, need to get into, but, and you'll all know what the explanations are, but um, it's a very long time not to sit down and have a private chat with somebody who leads a country which is a strategic competitor. Um, and uh, maybe out of that, some greater sense of strategic engagement will emerge. Um, one thing that, that I would ask you about China, and then we'll throw it open to a couple of questions from the floor, but about, um, about China is that they need to build a kind of middle power constituency mm. um, in Africa, or in Latin America, and in Asia, they're particularly in Asia. Um, and for a while, they seem to be doing that very well. And now I get the feeling they're not doing it so well. Um, that they, they, uh, they, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has, I mean, however these people vote yeah. in the General Assembly, well, 140 of them voted to denounce it, right? Um, but it, 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 it's not been popular. It's been seen as a terrible thing to do, even if they don't all announce that it is a terrible thing to do. And China won't want to get too drawn into defending Russian actions and will want to um, continue its middle power diplomacy and wolf warrior diplomacy isn't the best way to do that. Uh, I agree with that. And, uh... Uh, and there are many countries <coughs> you mentioned, and your, your own country, Australia, is one of them. That uh, many countries in Asia, being and Africa, mean to Australia, that's that, not good. Uh, uh, that um, uh, who have <coughs> a, a close, um, their, their biggest commercial ties are with China, mm -hmm. even if their main political and security and defence relationships are with the West. Uh, and I think the um, uh, when I talk to visitors from Africa, when I visit the Middle East, and, and uh, talk to Indian figures, uh, the, uh, there's a real concern out there that the world is going back into a bipolar world and countries will be forced to take sides. And most of these countries in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, Latin America, they don't want to take sides. They want to be able to manage this relationship together. You, you mentioned Indonesia, a remarkable uh, success story. But Indonesia is one of those. It does not want to be, have to take sides between China and the United States. In a sense, dealing with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you can all shelter behind each other and you can, uh, and you can point to the, the, the flaunting of the UN Charter and so on. Um, but when it comes down to your, your fundamental national interests, uh, it, you cannot give up your commercial, economic, and investment relationship with China, and you cannot give up your uh, whole range of relationships you have with Europe uh, and the United States. You do not want to choose. Uh, and I think that is uh, the danger of the world that we're moving towards. Um, I don't think we're in Cold War II. 
but you've got elements here where the Chinese are determined to end their dependence on the West, and the West is learning to its cost that it can't afford to be dependent upon China. Uh, and there's not going to be the end of globalization. It's not going to be the decoupling of the two economies, but it's going to be much greater caution about the areas where we have those dependencies, especially in technology. Um, uh, uh, but so many of the countries around the world uh, are going to want to try to avoid having to take sides in that dispute. Let's um, throw it open to any questions from you. We have, haven't got much time. You've only paid for an hour, <laughs> so you have about five minutes left. We might make it 10 minutes. We can go ask the Director General if we could go five minutes over time. Yeah. Let's see. Hello. Um, I have a question on uh, Iran. Just say who you are. Oh, sorry. My name is Simon. Um, uh, I have a question on... And what do you do? You oh, I'm a, a, a researcher working yeah. in the capital office. On Iran? Um, uh, no, not specifically. But, um, but the, my, my question is, um, looking at the, the kind of demographics of these protests, they are um, they're a lot more diverse than they have been in the past. So just looking at the 2009 Green Movements, which call for reform. These ones call for regime change. Um, and currently, um, the Islamic Republic keeps trying to Islamize society under the current presidency. My question is, do you think Iran can adapt towards these uh, protest demands? Uh, or do you have an assessment on the trajectory? I, 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 religion plays an important role, obviously, in, in all societies, um, uh, in particular, perhaps, in the Islamic world. Um, but to use it as a, a means of imposing order and as a vehicle for, for uh, repression, I think, drives people away from religion rather than uh, draws them uh, towards it. Um, and uh, uh, my experience of, um, uh, of working in the Middle East, in, uh, uh, whether it's in Egypt or Iraq or, or uh, working in, uh, visiting the Gulf, is people tend to wear their religion fairly lightly. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia is a very good example of how religion is just much less important in the society than it was before. Iran's got a long way to catch up with the rest of the uh, Islamic world, which is why I say I think um, the biggest force for change would be a new leader in Iran, taking it in a direction which respects the mood of the people, that they do not want to be disciplined and controlled and have their identities and their behaviors uh, uh, corrected uh, by the morality police. Saudi Arabia, for all the um, uh, mistakes that Mohammed bin Salman made in his early years in, in, in power, <clears throat> um, it, it has been a remarkable transformation of life in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, the way in which he has extraordinary support from under 35-year-olds in the country, whose lives have been transformed. They can go with their friends and, uh, uh, and, go and listen to music and dance and have parties and, and uh, uh, mix with members of the opposite uh, uh, sex, and uh, 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 they can have fun. Uh, and that has generated massive support for the regime, despite uh, the reservations about some of its uh, external behaviors. Um, I think the Iranians have got a lot they can learn from that. Yeah. Hello. Thank you both very much. It's a pleasure to uh, hear such uh, distinguished gentlemen. My name is Arthur Corbin Powells. I'm a CEO of Rulia. This is an impact technology company. I'm a founder of Project Ukraine and Find Refuge Online. So we're helping the refugees from Ukraine. My question is thus, you say that uh, the West has overestimated Russia, I agree, you know, in 08, should have been punished for Georgia, throwing the same sanctions then, it didn't happen. 14 as well, Crimea. Is it not the time right now in 2022 to give Ukraine the tanks and the airplanes they need to crush the uh, paper bear and, you know, scare the paper dragon? Thank you. Well, I think all of us in the room would, would share your sentiments that uh, we want the Ukrainians to be able to defend themselves, we want them to be able to uh, regain as much territory as they can. Um, and uh, uh, my own country, I'm actually, uh, I'm very critical of, um, of Boris Johnson and his leadership of the, uh, of the UK. But one area where I actually applaud was his uh, commitment uh, on, uh, on Ukraine. And I think British forces are doing more on the ground to uh, advise and support uh, uh, Ukrainian um, uh, uh, military 
and intelligence services than, than almost any other country, and that's, uh, uh, that's very positive. As I say, we have to be um, a little bit mindful of the wider implications. We all urge the Ukrainians on. Uh, their success in the East, their success, it seems, this week in, uh, in, uh, in, in Kherson. Um, but the better Ukraine does, the more vulnerable Russia becomes, uh, the Russian regime becomes, and the more dangerous it becomes for everyone. So we have to manage this to a certain extent. Um, but uh, uh, I sincerely hope that we will continue, governments, Western governments will continue to provide the high level of military support that they'll find a means of providing the economic support. I was very encouraged that the European Commission is drawing up a plan for provide one and a half billion dollars a month to Ukraine through 2023. That's matched by the United States. That will almost uh, balance the books for, for Ukraine. I think they need three and a half billion dollars a month in order to, uh, uh, to remain uh, uh, viable. Um, so it's an expensive business. Uh, the military side has gone rather well. The financial side needs, uh, needs buttressing, um, but uh, uh, it's possible to foresee the complete collapse of uh, Russian morale and the Russian military, but it's not likely. Um, I think it's going to be a, a hard slog in Ukraine uh, over the coming year. And at some point, I think we'll see pressure rising on all sides for some sort of armistice. Uh, I don't think there will be a, uh, a peace agreement between a Putin-led Russia and a Zelensky-led uh, Ukraine. But I do, think there's a, I do think there's a landing zone at some point during the course of next year, which could be achieved, combination of some Russian pushback, uh, some um, uh, uh, reconstruction for Ukraine, uh, and above all, security guarantees, security assurances, which will be difficult in a country whose borders are challenged and, and, and not finally agreed with its, uh, with its crucial neighbor. But I do think there's a landing zone that could be uh, achieved um, but it's not achievable at the moment, and it's well short of a peace agreement between the two sides. Uh, but a crucial element of this is to keep the Russians under military pressure, keep them going backwards, keep up the support for, uh, 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 from the West for the Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian military. Okay, well, uh, yeah. I think this will be, I'm out of time, so this will be our last question. Stephen. Uh, Stephen Green. John, thank you very much for a really interesting tour of, uh, of the big issues of our time. Uh, you didn't major very much on nuclearization, um, and indeed this discussion we've just had about how the Ukrainian uh, situation might resolve itself um, leaves open the question of whether Russia, in its um, weakness and in the extreme, decides to go nuclear, something that Putin has already, of course, threatened. What do you really think about uh, the, 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 the nuclear dimension to this all? Uh, well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that Putin waiving this nuclear threat has already had some impact which has benefited him. It's meant that the United States and European countries have put quite tight controls on what weapons provided can be used for by the Ukrainians. It's ensured that um, NATO forces are not engaged directly in the battle. Yes, there are plenty of NATO advisors there and uh, advisors from NATO countries. But they're not engaged in the war directly. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the, uh, this is exactly the, th the concern you mentioned. I know it's very high in the thinking of the White House, which presumably reflects the thinking of President Biden himself, that we have to be very cautious about this, this nuclear, uh, this risk of nuclear escalation. Um, uh, my own view on this is I think it very unlikely that Putin would use nuclear weapons in Ukraine uh, whilst the situation is broadly stable. There would just be no advantage for him uh, in doing so, and all sorts of disadvantages, not least the um, opprobrium of, uh, of India and China. I was quite struck and when Chancellor Schultz was in, uh, in, in China a week ago, the language the Chinese side used uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, against uh, uh, raising uh, the nuclear threat in, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. The concern grows, though, if regime survival in Moscow uh, comes into question. Uh, and that is when it gets dangerous uh, for us all. Uh, and Putin becomes unpredictable. If he's challenged inside the system, then one possible response is to raise the stakes. 
and create an external enemy, create a global crisis where he is the indispensable figure on the, on the Russian side. <clears throat> now, that's a pretty frightening scenario. Is why I think uh, Biden, Macron, Schultz um, uh, will all want to uh, try and manage the end of the Ukraine war, uh, uh, much though we'd, we'd, we'd be delighted if, if Putin was ousted from power. Uh, but there are dangers of someone like him, an autocratic figure uh, with a bristling with nuclear weapons, um, and with, with the language very close to the surface. So we do have to worry about that. But I only think it really comes into play <clears throat> at a time when, uh, 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 if Russia is totally humiliated and Russian uh, regime it, uh, 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 comes under threat. John, we've gone about uh, seven minutes over time, but um, nevertheless, I think you'll all agree with me. It's been a fantastic presentation, incredibly interesting and very clear and thoughtful. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting <laughs>